Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Scott Wurzbacher, and today we're going to take an adventure through the mountains and national parks of the Pacific Northwest, where awe is everywhere you look. There's so much natural beauty to see in the Western United States, and our national park system does a great job of both preserving and providing access to it. My own family and I have a goal to try to hit all of the U.S. national parks in our lifetime which is why I am so excited to talk with today's guest who has already hit so many of them and he's done it in an epic way. I have with me Andrew Kaczynski, a data analyst from Alexandria, Virginia. Andrew has a passion for travel and adventure. He has hiked and backpacked extensively throughout the US, checking off 36 national parks and 26 state high points to date. After returning from 2021 trips to Mount Whitney, California, and peaks in the San Juan National Forest, Colorado, Andrew felt compelled to expedite his adventure goals and embark on an epic journey. So after months of meticulous planning, Andrew and his wife, Lindsay, and their dog, Kona, packed up their Subaru Outback and set off on a six-month, 19,000-mile road trip. But he doesn't call this trip an experience of a lifetime because his fire within is roaring and he's already dreaming up how to keep the adventures rolling. But before we go to the next adventure, let's talk about this one that you just got back from. Andrew, my friend, welcome to the campfire. Thank you, Scott, for having me join the show. Yeah, man, I'm so excited. You like you literally like just got back from this six month adventure, I think a month ago. Yep. Returned at the end of September. Yeah, so it, so it's fresh on your mind. I, let's start with like, how are you doing with the re-entry? What's it like coming back from so, such an epic trip and and getting back into so-called real life? Um, it hasn't been too hard. Uh, I got back and had a few days before I had to return to work. And that weekend before returning to work, I actually did an adventure race um, in Virginia, um, you know, where I'm from. So it was kind of one last hurrah before having to get back to to the office and into the day job. So amazing! So you had to just pack one more thing in when you got back before you got back to it. That's so cool. What That's what right. was the adventure race? Uh, it's a combination race of uh, trail running, mountain biking, paddling, and route finding. So you show up the morning of the race, and they don't you know they give you the map that morning, and you have to navigate the course, finding checkpoints along the way. And I did the um, 10 hour course and uh, it was a lot of fun. Wow, man, that's a, that, that, that might be another podcast episode in itself. We're going to have to circle back to that one. That sounds super cool. Well, Andrew, just tell us a little bit about you and your family and uh, just kind of set some context for listeners. Who is Andrew? Sure. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia, um, born here, raised here. Um, when I finished school, I came back uh, to Arlington and settled in Alexandria and have been living here since. Um, Lindsay and I married three years ago and got our dog just before the pandemic. Uh, so she's a pandemic puppy <laughs> and, um, you know, settled into a job here, got a, got a rhythm going. Um, but growing up, I always had an interest in the outdoors and adventures, backpacking, hiking, cycling. Um, so I always made time for doing a trip or two um, every year in the summer, particularly, but also winter trips um, to go snowboarding. And um, and then this year, just thought we'd step it up a little bit and, and go on this epic adventure uh, to the Pacific Northwest and to Alaska. Yeah. So, you know, in your intro, we said Andrew felt compelled to expedite his adventure goals and embark on an epic journey. So you'd ha- you'd been to Mount Whitney, you'd been to San Juan National Forest. Like, what what was it for you that got you to that that kind of made you feel like this? We need to light this fire. We need to expedite things. Yeah, I think um, it was a combination of factors, but it all probably started um, 
<clears throat> with our canceled trips from 2020, mm. you know, the first year of the pandemic, um, just, you know, hanging out at home and, and not getting to do the, the trips that we love. Um, Whitney was planned for 2020 and we canceled that. We canceled a Colorado trip. Um, and then we got to do those trips in 2021 and coming back from them and just having, you know, great memories and, and having so many more things on our list that we wanted to still accomplish. And, um, you know, I follow a couple people on social media who are based in the Pacific Northwest and they're always posting about the Cascade volcanoes. And it, it just seemed like a really awesome place that I wanted to visit and dedicate a lot of time to exploring. Yeah. So, so you start planning this, this epic adventure. Um, and I, we'll come back to kind of some of the, some of the motivations and the planning and all that, but, but I guess for listeners, can you give us an overview of the trip itself? Where, where'd you go? We know it was six months. We know you covered 19,000 miles, but let, let's, let's hear some more details. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, ground to cover over 19,000 miles. So <laughs> uh, we left Virginia and Maryland in April and our first major stop was in Colorado where we met up with some friends and spent four days um, skiing and snowboarding in Colorado. Um, the next major stop was the national parks in Utah, nice. which I'd been to before, but um, Lindsay hadn't been. Um, so that was a lot of fun going to um, Canyonlands, Arches, Bryce Canyon, and Zion. Mm -hmm. From there, we did, did uh, California and um, saw friends in San Francisco and uh, climbed Mount Shasta in Northern California. And then we moved on to Oregon and started the Pacific Northwest journey um, where we spent a lot of time um, in Central Oregon, uh, Bend area and Ashland mm -hmm. in Southern Oregon, um, climbing Mount Hood. Um, and then as we moved on to um, Washington, we climbed uh, Mount St. Helens Mount Baker, Mount Rainier. So we had a lot of uh, mountaineering goals in the Pacific Northwest, and we're really excited to have uh, had the opportunity to climb those those peaks. That brought us through May, and then um, was kind of phase two of our trip where we went to Alaska. So um, I did the drive um, up through Canada, uh, British Columbia and the Yukon into Canada or into Alaska. And then um, met Lindsay there, and she joined for about two weeks, two and a half weeks, um, and we explored national parks and you know Anchorage and uh, the peninsula there. Um, and then she had to go back to the East Coast for the remainder of the summer. She joined me for a week later, um, and from there on out, I had um, a couple friends joining me, um, doing backpacking trips and and hiking. And I had a few um, weeks or a few days here and there where I was by myself as well. Um, but by the end of it, I got to go to all eight of the national parks in Alaska, um, got to see pretty much the entire state from Anchorage and Juneau to Fairbanks, um, all the way up to the northernmost city in Alaska, Ukiagvik, uh, also known as Barrow, um, nice. and all, made it on the west western coast of Alaska too. Uh, Nome and Kotzebue, so really made it all over, which was really the goal um, to pack in as much as possible and to really see the whole state. Um, and we were really glad that we were able to do that. Man, you really did pack it all a lot in. Um, so when when did you finish in Alaska? And because I know your trip was basically through the end of September, I think, or the, was it right? Yeah, so September uh, 18th, I took the ferry from Alaska. I, I got on the ferry and left Alaska. And then the 21st of September is when I arrived in Bellingham, Washington with my car on the ferry. Cool. It's a three day ferry ride. And then from there, I drove back um, to the East Coast. Man, what that's, I mean, seriously an epic trip. And, and I'm kind of looking, I just was kind of making notes as you were, as you were talking, just to follow this whole thing, like the month of April, you climbed Mount Shasta, Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, Mount Baker, and Mount Rainier. That's a lot of mountaineering in one month. Those were all in, in May. Yeah. In May. Okay. In May. Yeah. So you kind of have, you have kind of two, two phases of this trip. Um, you did a whole bunch of mountaineering in the 
you know, in the kind of the lower 48. Um, and then, and then Alaska was like more sightseeing. Did you climb any peaks in, in Alaska? Um, not any, um, you know, major peaks as you might define them in, in the lower 48, right? So in Alaska, once you get above, you know, seven or 8,000 feet, they're, they're glaciated and, yeah. and have snow on them year round. So, um, the highest I think I ever got in Alaska was about 6,000 feet, 6, um, feet. but still, you know, climbed mountains, nothing like Rainier. Yeah. It's, I, I didn't need, didn't need my ice axe in Alaska. Didn't use my ice axe. Got it. Well, I, you know, I really, um, we haven't had anybody on the podcast yet. That's really covered the the state of, the, of Alaska and, and the kind of the ground that you've covered is so incredible in all the parks. I'd really love to spend some time there. I guess before we go to Alaska, tell us some of the highlights of the, of the mountaineering pieces and, and, and some of your favorite things that you experienced in the lower 48. Yeah, definitely. So the mountaineering, um, expeditions was definitely like my my major goal um, of part one of the trip and was like the, the inspiration um, for that half of the trip. Um, I've been kind of gradually over the years stepping up my climbing and mountaineering um, and mostly have experience in Colorado. Um, but, you know, I've seen so many pictures of um, Mount Hood that that was just, you know, top of my list. It's such a really it's a beautiful mountain and it's got a really unique um approach from the south where you take this hogs back ridge and it's just an awesome looking mountain and um i did it once uh by myself this may and had a great time um got to the summit right for sunrise it was a beautiful sunrise uh great conditions and then a week later i had a few friends fly out to oregon and we climbed it a second time. Wow. Um, and, and I got to lead them up there, which was a lot of fun too. Under a little bit different conditions, it was a little foggy. And, um, but at the top, we had great, great views. And you could see um, all the other major peaks in Oregon. So um, that was a really cool experience. And then Mount Rainier was also, um, you know, one of the things on our list because, you know, we're casually checking off the state high points. Um, so both Hood and Rainier are state high points of Oregon and Washington. Um, so Hood, I did by myself. I felt comfortable. There's no um, real crevasses or risk there. Um, but but M Mount Rainier is a kind of an, on another level. It's got lots of glaciers, lots of crevasses. So the risk there is a little bit higher. So we joined a, a guided group and had, um, you know, three or four guides who let us led our group up the mountain and it was actually a week-long trip where we did Mount Baker in the first three days and then we did Mount Rainier in the second three days and um, we were feeling a little bit um, we weren't sure if we were going to make it to the summit because uh, Washington got a lot of late season snow this year yeah and the avalanche conditions were just um, kind of iffy so there had only been a few successful guided um, expeditions by that point in May. Uh, out of the 30 or 40 attempts, there had only been two successes. Um, so we weren't feeling too optimistic, but, you know, we were trying to have a good time. And uh, our guys told us the day before our summit bid, you know, we'll have to just check on the conditions and see how it looks. You know, we don't take any, you know, excess risks. Um, but turns out the summit bid day was, you know, perfect weather and, we got up there and made it all the way to the top. And so that was just extra special to be able to get there when, um, you know, so many people hadn't had that fortune this, this season. Yeah. It's so beautiful. And the thing is that you're talking May, that's kind of early season for those peaks. So these are not like, that's not like total summer conditions. I mean, it's. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, um, freezing rain and snowing while we were up there. I've got, you know, photos with my snow icicles on my hat. And uh, so I'll have to post one of those maybe on your show notes. Yeah, for sure. We'd love to see that. Yeah. I mean, and I, like, I want to go, so obviously you're okay with these Arctic conditions because, you know, next thing you do is you go up into Alaska, but um, I got to ask you, because this, this is, there's so much mountaineering in this. What is it that calls you to the mountains and specifically kind of this technical climbing? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, I really like backpacking and, and just being in the mountains themselves because it's just so grand, um, you know, the views and feeling so small and something so massive. Mm. Um, so for, just for that reason alone, I like mountains in general. And then the snow just adds like another layer of awe and awesomeness to the whole to the whole thing. Um, and honestly, actually, the snow sometimes is easier to climb than a steep, rocky or scree uh, slope because you have more traction. Um, so it, sometimes it's not even more difficult, but, um, and then also being able to do it um, in a spring-like or early summer condition where it's 60 degrees and you can be hiking in a t-shirt, but then you're on the snow is, is just kind of a cool experience. Yeah, totally. Well, and so in, in those kinds of conditions and, you know, the challenge that you're experiencing, like how does fear come into this for you? Um, it's, it's part of it, I would say. Um, I think you have to have, you know, I think a little bit of fear is healthy, but mm -hmm. you know, you, I don't try to take too many risks. Um, you know, I do have, uh, like, a a Garmin safety uh, device if something were to go wrong. And I almost always on hikes like that will hike with, with a buddy or a group. Um, you know, if something's too easy, it's, it may not be as rewarding. So, so <laughs> try not to always take uh, the easy way out, which has kind of continuously led to more challenging endeavors. I want to, can we go a little bit deeper on that? I love what you just said. If something's too easy, it might not give you enough of a challenge. I think you said. Right. Um, yeah, I, I'm always trying to push, you know, push myself um, to kind of the next level and, and try things that push me a little bit out of your comfort zone. And, and, you know, I just find a lot of reward in that. Yeah. That's super cool. Me, you must've been feeling like reward after reward on this trip. Which, <laughs> which of the peaks did you find the most rewarding? I think it was Mount Hood um, because I had just been looking forward to it so much and had mm -hmm. seen so many pictures and um, it's just such a cool mountain. Um, and also that one is one that I, I did myself. You know, I planned the whole thing. I, I studied the route. Um, I had the maps. I checked out the conditions. Um, so being able to do it um, leading yourself or leading a, a small group is really re rewarding for me because it it tests you not only physically but mentally um so when we did mount baker and mount rainier uh, we had the guides who basically told us you know here's what we're doing here's how we're going to do it here's what you need to do um, which it was still challenging physically um but it didn't have that quite level that level of mental uh challenge that that mount hood and other trips that you that you lead yourself on have yeah. So I'm getting the vibe that like there's the, the mental side is kind of almost like a problem solving. Cause you did when you and I spoke before this call, kind of just getting, getting to know each other. And you mentioned that like the guided trips weren't as uh, rewarding for you because you liked this kind of idea of figuring it out on your own. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we might get into this when we talk about Alaska, but we did, um, four backpacking trips in Alaska that were totally off trail. You know, these parks in Alaska don't have, you know, standard trails like you may see in the lower 48. So you're bushwhacking and, and navigating yourself, which was just an awesome challenge. So Man, I love things like that. That's cool. So um, like for listeners, I mean, what, what was your mountaineering experience and backpacking experience prior to these trips? Um, I've, you know, I grew up, um, as a boy scout. Um, so, uh, in high school, I had a lot of experience. Um, we traveled all over the U S, um, doing week long backpacking trips. Um, so I had that experience and I continued it, um, as I, you know, as I grew older through, um, after scouting and, um, the last probably four or five years I've done an annual trip to Colorado, um, usually flying into Durango and, and spending time in the San Juan mountains and the San, um, in that area, uh, in early, early June, mid June, uh, where there's still a lot of snow, especially at 13,000, 14,000 feet. Um, so climbing those mountains, um, 
we use ice axe and crampons and and we don't rope up there because there's no glaciers or crevasses mm -hmm. and um but that just has been a really great intro into mountaineering so this tr this six months trip that you'd taken this was not the first time you had a ice axe in your hand and you, right. you, you and, and so I think part of the disclaimer here is don't set out on a six month trip and just think <laughs> you're going to go climb a bunch of mountains. There's some experience behind what you what you set out to do here. Yeah, the experience is, uh, you know, you can't replace experience. Um, so, you know, I went out with a friend those first couple of years and and we, you know, built up our skills together, you know, practicing self arrest where you slide down a hill and use your ice axe to stop your fall do that on you know a slope that is gentle and you can see where it ends and, and practice your technique there so that if you ever have to use it you have that practice and experience yeah man that's epic stuff and and the thing about those mountains and especially with the snow like we talk on this podcast a lot about one of my favorite words which is awe and uh one of my favorite dictionary definitions of awe is this feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder. And I just got to believe that, that you were just experiencing lots of moments of awe while you're out there. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of moments. It's not, not every hike. Um, you know, I enjoy hiking and, and rarely is there a bad hike, but, um, certain hikes in particular, whether it be the conditions or, you know, the group that you're with or, you come around a corner and there's just an amazing view or in particular um one memory i have is we were in gates of the arctic national park in alaska and the weather was just crummy all week it was cloudy and foggy um, but i was doing a hike one day and then all of a sudden there was five or ten minutes where the clouds finally cleared and you could just see these amazing jagged peaks mm. um, and, and moments like that are, are just amazing and, and totally awe um, you know, you kind of just have to stand there and take it all in and yeah. What, what does that feel like to, how do you experience the awe? What does it feel like for you? Um, you know, it's, it's oftentimes just kind of unbelievable how incredible it is. Um, you know, that experience in Gates of the Arctic, um, <clears throat> we, we took a bush plane that dropped us off there so we were 100 miles from you know any kind of town and so you're just you know in the middle of the wilderness totally wild um you know and, and the clouds finally cleared and you get this amazing view and you know my jaw you know just kind of drops and you kind of just have to take it in and you're like wow this is you know this is what it's about this is why we do this um you know it's it's just amazing it is kind of that feeling of smallness though, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's huge. Like that's why I love the mountains because they're so big. And um, I love when you're doing a backpacking trip and you hike for a couple hours or a day or two and you get to a viewpoint where you can see, you know, I was over there, you know, <laughs> five or 10 or 15 miles away or however so. And you can see that's where I was standing you know, a couple of hours ago or a day ago, and now I'm here and, you know, I walked here or, you know, I, you know, I made it here, you know, by myself, you know, no, no aid or assistance. And it's just incredible to be able to cover train and, in that kind of environment. And so big, you know, you being so small and it being so big is, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting this feeling like it's like this, just honestly, there's this feeling of being alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, when you're on a mountain, uh, especially mountaineering, um, you feel totally alive. And yeah, there's no no better feeling than that. Yeah. I'm curious if you can remember sort of like the first time you experienced that, like that hook to the mountains, maybe that first awe experience, that first feeling of being alive out in nature that, that kind of set you off on this path. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, the, there may be one before this, but the first one that comes to mind is when I did, um, Angels Landing in Zion National okay. Park. Um, I did that with the Boy Scouts, uh, when I was in high school and that's an incredible hike. And it was so great that we were, we did that hike again this year on our nice. road trip. 
Nice. Um, but for those who don't know, Angel's Landing is um, this hike in Zion. It's permitted, so you, you got to get your permit. Um, and then you, you climb up. There's a bunch of switchbacks. It's a pretty popular trail. And then you'll reach a point where um, the permits are required. Um, so there's fewer people beyond that point. And it's just this narrow ledge with thousand foot drops on the left side and right side. And you've got, you know, four or five foot wide path. And at points there's rock scrambling and a chain link fence that gives you some support. And then eventually you get up to the top, which is just this rock that overlooks the Zion Valley. And it's, it's just incredible. So I think, I think that is the first memory that comes to mind. That was kind of that awe experience. And what do you think it was about that hike that, that triggered this love? You know, we talked about the fear and kind of the, the challenge. Um, and that, that probably played a big role there because, um, yeah, the cliffs and the drop-offs on, on the sides of Angel's Landing are, are serious and you gotta be real careful. Um, so I think that played a role. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, like you and I talked a little bit before this call, like, I think you and I share like this kind of pragmatic uh, approach to life. And I've got to believe that when you're up there with that kind of danger around you, that you sort of get this laser focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I like taking photos, so my phone or camera is, is often out, but um, you got to be focused. Um, yeah. No room for error. So. Um, but it's easy to focus because, um, you're enjoying it so much. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So, all right. Well, I want to make sure we, we have enough time to, to go up into Alaska and talk about the parks up there. So, so leaving the Pacific Northwest, you got a chance to drive up through, through Canada, take, take us through that journey. And then, man, Alaska is so vast. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did the drive and I think it only took, um, two days to get from Seattle to uh, Skagway. Um, it's about 30 hours. Um, so it was some serious uh, long days driving, but it actually wasn't bad because it's so scenic and it was so pretty. And um, also the long summer days really helps to not getting dark. Mm. Oh, true. Yeah. Um, so the drive wasn't bad. And then um, the first park we did was Glacier Bay National Park. Okay. Um, where we went backcountry sea kayaking. Nice. So we rented some kayaks and we spent two nights. We got dropped off um, inside Glacier Bay and um, did some paddling for a couple days. Um, we had perfect conditions. We were a little scared because it's a little notorious for um, rain, cold, um, waves it's a it's a large bay it's you know miles wide so it, it can get pretty big waves uh, mosquitoes but we didn't have any of that and it was just perfect conditions um the first day actually we were paddling and uh i heard this noise that i didn't recognize and i i couldn't figure out what it was i heard it two or three times and finally i turned around and i saw um some water that was being sprayed and at that point i realized that it was a whale um, a humpback whale that was uh, probably three quarters of a mile away from us. So at that point, we kind of just stopped paddling and watched it for a few minutes. And it gradually got closer to us. And um, it kind of just hung out and swam near us for probably 30 or 45 minutes, which was just absolutely amazing. Oh, my God. Talk, talk about awe. I, what, what was there, um, you know, was there any connection there? Like just that experience of like that, I mean, massive animal, like what, what was that like? Yeah. So I, we had seen some, um, whales as the boat was taking us to the drop off point. Um, so we knew that they were out there and we knew, um, we might have a chance of seeing one. Um, and then on the boat, there's, you know, hundreds of other people sharing that experience with you all have their cameras out. Um, but then to be out there paddling by ourselves, just our small group, and um, for the whale to come up and, and hang out with us for a while was really cool. Um, very special. Uh, yeah. Awesome. It's unbelievable. Wow. Did you get any pictures of the whale? We got pic lots of pictures and some videos too. So yeah, I'll share those. That would be amazing to share. Yeah. Um, Glacier Bay. Okay. And then uh, where did we go from Glacier Bay? 
from Glacier Bay, the next stop was uh, Kenai Fjords National Park mm -hmm. after um, a quick layover in Juneau and then in Anchorage. Um, so kind of between um, each segment of adventure, um, tried to take a little bit of time to shower and do laundry and just decompress and take a little bit of time between uh, the yeah, trips. <laughs> um, Important. Important. Yeah. So Kenai Fjords is also awesome. It's got lots of glaciers, um, ice fields. So that was a little bit um, of a different experience. Also got to do some hiking there to the Harding Ice Field. Um, and we also did a boat tour there where we saw lots of marine wildlife, lots of whales, um, sea lions, otters, um, you know, all, all different types, bald eagles, um, puffins, different birds. Um, so, I mean, that, that's only two of the national parks. Yeah. We, I mean, we covered all eight, so it was, it was really cool. What, what can you run down the list? What are the other six? All right. So we, we talked about Glacier Bay and yep. Kenai Fjords. Yep. Um, we also did uh, Denali yep. um, is drivable. And then Gates of the Arctic, I mentioned, is where the weather cleared. And we finally saw uh, those, those awesome jagged peaks. Uh, Kobuk Valley National Park is also above the Arctic Circle. So it's near, uh, it's, well, relatively near uh, Gates of the Arctic. Um, so in Kobuk Valley, I did a backpacking trip. Um, in September, and uh, that was the only place on our trip that I saw the Northern Lights because it was far enough north, and at that point in September, it was finally getting dark enough um, to be able to see them. So one night when it was clear, I finally got to see the Northern Lights in Kobuk Valley. Yeah, that's a bucket list item, and you actually sent me one of those pictures already. I'm like, can you just, I mean, I want to stop on the Northern Lights for a second, because I think that's something that's on a lot of people's bucket lists, including mine. Talk to me about what, what that's like to experience that. Um, it was it was really cool. I wasn't expecting it, I guess, mm -hmm. because, you know, I hadn't seen them so far this summer. Yeah. Um, but what you need are... Um, uh, darkness, obviously, and you need a clear sky. So if there's clouds, you won't be able to see them. And then there has to be the right um, activity level. So um, those kind of combinations have to all coincide. And so I got lucky enough for one night to see them. So I think I, I think I, I don't think I even set an alarm. I think I just woke up naturally in the middle of the night and decided to pop my head out. And uh, sure enough, there was some northern lights. Um, they actually showed up on my phone, I think maybe even better than they looked in real life. Um, so the photos turned out really cool. Um, you know, you may have seen videos uh, of Northern Lights where they're kind of dancing yeah. and moving throughout the sky. Yeah. So that's something that maybe surprised me because I didn't see them dancing, maybe because that's like a time lapse or over, you know, a longer period of time. They didn't yeah. really seem to move, but nonetheless, they were still really cool. So you're, I mean, it's the middle of the night. You said you just happened to poke your head out. Like what time is it? I mean, just roughly. Probably two in the morning. Yeah. So you'd already been sleeping. You just kind of woke up and thought to put, poke your head out the window. I mean, what was that like, you know, something you'd heard about for a long time and you weren't expecting it? Yeah, I, I think I actually got up because I heard something, but I guess I was trying to investigate what was, what was out there. But um, it was just really cool, you know, to be surprised like that and to, for something unexpected um to to come out and uh it was a bucket list item for us so glad that we got to experience that yeah it had to have woken you up right like did you kind of like rub your eyes like oh my gosh what's going on here <laughs> yeah yeah a little bit yeah and it was really cool too because i was camping on a beach um along the river there um so it was just a, a really cool scene to have the lights on the river um and in the mountains and the trees there too it was really neat man absolutely epic okay so you covered i think we've covered five or six and i think there's a couple more yeah so uh lake clark is another one okay um lake clark national park is just west of anchorage uh like an hour long flight um we did a really cool uh one-way backpack within lake clark um saw these absolutely amazing turquoise lakes that just had the neatest color yeah. to them. And um, the mountains there were really epic. Um, 
we got a lot of solitude and the flight from Anchorage to Lake Clark was also just extremely beautiful. So, um, you know, if someone is looking to have a really cool Alaska experience, but they're not comfortable, you know, going into the back country and, you know, tackling something like that, you could always do a sightseeing tour. And this is super convenient because it's from Anchorage and it was just absolutely beautiful, the flight. Awesome. Okay. Sweet. Um, and then we also went to Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Um, that was the last one that I went to. So that was mid-September. And um, on the one hand, I was a little bit bummed because I didn't, um, this is the one place I didn't allocate enough time to. So I only had a, uh, two or three days there, which wasn't enough to go backpacking. And it was also at the end of their season. So all the services were shutting down um, and we actually got to take a flight on, I think they're the second to last day that the pilots were, were running flights. Um, but on the, on the plus side, it was absolutely beautiful because the fall colors were starting to come out. Wow. And um, I took the sightseeing tour where there were just different layers on the mountain, the lowest layer being green. And then as you worked up the mountain, it changed, you know, to, to a, an orange color and a yellow color and red color. And at the top was, um, were snow. Um, so they just got like their first testing of snow. So all those different colors combined on the mountain. It was, it was just beautiful. Wow. That's amazing. So, um, I think did we get all eight. Uh, I think so. Oh no, no, no. The last one, which is, uh, which we definitely should talk about is Katmai yes. uh, national park. So Katmai is where, um, is really famous because it's where a lot of the bears go yep. um, during the salmon run. Um, so if people are familiar with uh, Bear Week, um, where you know the public gets to vote on which bear became the fattest <laughs> over the summer, uh, this is where those pictures and those bears are from, uh, Katmai National Park. So uh, we were super lucky and got a permit to go stay at Brooks Camp which is where the bears um, go. And um, so we stayed there for three nights and got to see um, all these bears feeding on the salmon, um, standing above a waterfall, waiting for the salmon to run and the salmon jump upstream to go um, back to where they were born to spawn. And, and the bears try to catch them, you know, as they're swimming upstream, it was just really cool to watch. So I just, we, we got to make sure that uh, everybody's very clear because you sent me a picture of a bear catching salmon and it is like national, it's a national geographic looking shot, but I have confirmed that that was actually taken by you and your camera. Um, That's man, right. What a cool picture. So yeah. I want to know what, what kind of bears are we talking? Are, are we talking grizzlies? Are we talking brown bear? Yeah. So these are grizzlies or they're, well, they're brown bears. Um, okay. The terminology brown bear and, and grizzlies are are kind of, they mean somewhat the same thing. It's just more of a um, inland versus coastal thing. Got it. Um, but we'll call them brown bears. Um, and, you know, they get really large, you know, thousand pounds for the males. Um, some of them had cubs. So the cubs typically stick with the mother for one to two summers. Um, so the, the youngest cubs, you know, were really small and cute and we watched, you know, the, the moms definitely, uh, you know, being very, eye keeping an eye on their cubs and very watchful. And then the, um, the two-year-old cubs also were very cool and they, they played with one another a lot. So that was really fun to watch. Mm. Um, and just also to mention the number of bears, you know, they all go to this spot because it's it's no it's known for the number of salmon so they all congregate there um so there was a point where we were watching um at one at one moment there were 30 bears within oh our view goodness gracious all feeding on these salmon which was just amazing okay so i gotta just i gotta get a i gotta paint a picture here because you said you were there for three nights you got a permit what are your accommodations like and you know are are you staying in a tent at this point? Yes. So there's two ways you can do it. Um, the, the first way is there is a lodge. 
So again, if you're not in the camping, you can still experience this and you can stay at the lodge, but you have to know that the lodge books out about two years in advance uh -huh. and it's like $900 a night or something crazy like that. Um, the alternative is to do what we did, which is to get a permit to camp. Uh, and that is also tricky because you need to log on to recreation.gov at a certain time and you got to be quick on the mouse and you got to snag a permit real fast. Um, but we were really lucky to do that. And then you get to camp for, you know, 20 bucks or whatever it is. And um, I think the campsite accommodates maybe 60 people a night. Okay. And the park service sets up a electric fence uh -huh. to keep the bears out. Okay. So we just hope the electricity doesn't go out. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I don't know. They must have a generator or something. <laughs> so how, how close were you to a bear at any given point? Um, so there's quite a bit of facilities. So like there's a boardwalk, um, where the bears are, are close to you. So when we were on the boardwalk, you know, a bear could walk right on, underneath the boardwalk. Um, that was pretty common. Um, but then I would say to get to the falls, you have to walk on about a mile long trail. And because, you know, a trail is the easiest path, you know, least resistance, not only the, do the humans walk on the trail, but mm -hmm. the bears also walk on the trail. So there were twice, there were two moments where we were walking, you know, one direction on the trail and then coming towards us was a bear. Mm. So we, you know, just stepped off the trail, probably 30 or 40 feet and let the bear pass. And it kind of just continued on its way. Um, so we're sharing the environment. You're living really amongst the bears which was just an awesome experience. Wow. Like, Hey buddy, not, not here to yeah. hurt you. Just come on through. <laughs> yeah. well, um, so are you carrying bear spray? Is there any, like anything you're, you're doing to kind of keep yourself protected? It's really interesting. Um, you would think that absolutely you would want to carry bear spray, but as soon as you arrive to Brooks camp, they actually um, give you a bear school orientation. Okay. And um, they didn't say this, but to me, it felt like basically forget everything you thought you knew about bear safety because there it's different. So because the, the bear are so concentrated on the salmon, they really don't mind the people. Um, so the park rangers actually encourage you not to carry bear spray. Okay. Um, and they, you know, they're pretty confident. Um, you know, there haven't been any attacks or anything, uh, recently. So. Um, no need for bear spray. Just, you know, be cautious. Don't bring any food or smellables with you when you're out on the trail. Right. Okay. How about the, uh, the make a lot of noise as you're walking? Is that, is that still, uh, is that still a good one to follow? Yep. That's still, that's still a good rule to follow. And also like, you know, walking groups or, you know, be with a buddy. So got it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What an, I mean, I'm just kind of blown away. I, I am in awe right now. I'm experiencing awe right now just because of all the stuff that you got to do on this trip between the peaks and the mountaineering and the northern lights and the salmon, uh, the bears. I mean, wow. So one thing I've always thought, because I, I would love to hit all those parks that you hit, and I've looked at the map, and I know like kind of how interspersed they are all around the state, and you can't drive from park to park. So talk, can you talk about like transportation? If you wanted to go to Alaska and visit all those parks like you did, how do you get from park to park? Yeah, I think of the eight national parks, maybe three of them are drivable. Um, so the others require a plane or a boat, and usually it's a plane. Um, so there are lots of pilots in Alaska, you know, travel by plane is really common because there's not much of a road system. So it's not only the parks, but to get to a lot of the towns, villages and cities requires a plane. Um, so there are a lot of uh, private planes that you could charter um, to get to a, to a park. So that's what I did. I contacted pilots, um, set up um, private private charters. So uh, I think maybe three times I got to fly in a small Cessna or similar type plane that had just me and, you know, my one other companion and the pilot in it. Wow. And you're a planner. So you did, so most of this you planned in advance. It doesn't sound like this was a, uh, a make it up as you go kind of trip. That's right. We, you know, we had spreadsheets and planning documents and in all of that. So we've been, we planned it 
you know, starting nine months out and um, had every last detail. You know, we, we don't like to fly by the seat of our pants or, you know, we really need to know where we're sleeping every night and not trying to figure that out at the last minute, especially with the flights, because um, the pilots get booked up and yeah, you need to have reservations pretty far out. Yeah. And that's such an interesting thing because a lot of times, like, you know, people have a perception of somebody that's like going out into the wilderness as just being kind of a free spirit. Like, I just want to go be free and just kind of make it up as I go. And, you know, again, like there was experience involved. There was a lot of planning involved. Like, and I also kind of wonder if that, like that, that planning and the experience and all that kind of wrapped up is, is sort of getting countered by going out into the wild where there is, it's like sort of controlled um, uncertainty, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, everyone has a different approach and for us, this worked out really well and it was kind of how we had to do it. Um, but we definitely met people traveling who were doing everything last minute. And it seems like sometimes that'll work out for them. Um, and they'll be able to snag a last minute permit because somebody canceled. Um, but sometimes it seems like it wouldn't work out because they didn't have the permit or they didn't have the reservation. Um, so just because we wanted to really optimize yeah. our time, um, it was really important to us to be able to, to plan it out. Yeah. When you go someplace that far away, like a lot of the national parks that have like lotteries for limited amounts of permits that they give out and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know this firsthand from, from going to places like Yosemite and, you know, wanting to put in permits for half dome and, and places where you want to do these things. And if you wait till the last minute, yeah, you, you lose out. So, yeah. um, I definitely can appreciate that. Oh my gosh, this was so packed full. And so like, you know, we started out talking about how you felt compel compelled to expedite your adventure goals. I know I mentioned that uh, early on. And so you did that. And so you expedited these adventure goals and you went on this epic adventure. What's next? Is there more expediting? Did you get it out of your system? Um, well, we have, you know, we have quite a bit of plans. So um, our first plan, I guess, is that we're actually going to be moving to the West Coast. Okay. So um, we've lived on the East Coast in Virginia and Maryland our entire lives. Um, and so we just decided to try something new get a little bit closer to that outdoor action um we're planning on moving to bend oregon um be closer to those pacific northwest and cascade mountains and and really check off some more of those uh mountaineering goals that we have so that's that's step one and then um this january we're actually also going to uh do a ski and snowboard trip to the dolomites in italy wow okay. um, so that's the next the next uh thing that we have on the books um for adventures that's amazing so do you maintain some kind of like a vision board or a list of like a bucket list or anything like that yeah i've got um i've got a document where i both keep track of all the hikes and trips that i've done and also um have a list of uh hikes and backpacking trips and things like that that i want to do um and I haven't fully flushed it out, but I also thought it would be kind of cool to put together like a five year plan, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the question, you know, the cliche question you always get asked in an interview, what's, what's your plan for the next five years? Well, why can't you do that for like your personal goals too? So yeah. I thought that might be fun, kind of fun to put together, you know, these big adventures, like we want to go to Patagonia and we've been reading about this, uh, Annapurna circuit in Nepal yeah. that, that looked really cool. Um, so like, how could you plan those out over the next couple of years? We might, might need to figure that out, man. It's, uh, it, it's, it's epic. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like we have several more podcast, uh, interviews and episodes to do. So I want to, uh, I want to kind of wrap this up. I think, um, I'd like to just sort of have you talk a little bit to the listeners directly. Like if, if people are kind of interested in this sort of, you know, this epic adventure, um, like you took, um, or maybe, maybe they don't have six months, um, to be able to block off. Like what, what advice would you have for people that are listening to this podcast that think what you've done is amazing and they want to go see some of the things that you got to see? What advice would you have for, for people? 
Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I would say just do it. Like, you know, unequivocally, it's going to be so worth it. Like, it's, it's going to be awesome. So definitely prioritize it. Um, you know, when I was planning this trip, my friend had told me, you're not going to regret doing this. <laughs> and I thought that was so weird because, of course, I wasn't going to regret it. And in fact, I would, I think I was going to regret if I didn't do it. Yeah. Right. So it, it was just really important to me to be able to do it. And I think, um, you know, everyone should place that kind of importance on experiences um, because, you know, as cliche as it is, you only get one life and it goes by really quickly. So make sure to, to really do um, things that are going to have a great, you know, opportunity and experience for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, of course, that uh, Hollywood's going to pick up on you at some point because you're making all these epic adventures and and uh, they're going to make a movie about you. But I think they're probably going to make multiple movies. There's going to probably be a series about it, the Andrew Kaczynski series because um, it's going to be like, you know, the Alaska series and then they're going to go to the Dolomites and then they're going to go to Nepal and they're going to follow your journey. But I want to know in this series of movies they're going to make about your life, who's going to be the actor that's going to play you? So I gave this some thought and uh, the actor who's going to play me is John Krasinski. Yeah, that's so awesome. Do you know what's so <laughs> funny? I was thinking about that. Like I, that's exactly who I thought of before you said that. And I think he's perfect. I love it. That's he. Oh. That's, a, that's a perfect one. Love that. Okay. So great. I'm we're, glad we're in agreement. We're, we're totally in agreement dialed in. And so um, what's the movie, what's the first movie in the series going to be called? So it's going to be called beyond the beltway um nice. you know because we're we're from the washington dc area um, dc has their beltway 495 um and just you know this trip to us was kind of getting out there going beyond and exploring you know a different area and, and really getting out there man you got out there you definitely got beyond the beltway I am so thankful. This has been so much fun. I'm like, you know, a lot of the places that you've been have been on my bucket list. And now I'm like even more excited. Northern Lights, going to see the bears, the parks of Alaska. I mean, just epic. And uh, I really appreciate you spending the time with us. And, and for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope that Andrew's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or you need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Andrew, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, Scott.